Amen. Thank you, Troy, for that. You can grab a seat if you're at home. You're already sitting down, I'm sure. I've been praying over Two Cities Church. I've been praying over me. I've been praying over you this week. And my, been, my prayer has come directly out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 18. The Bible says, out of deep darkness, the blind will see. And if you're watching this service from your house, you're thinking to yourself, Jeez, Jeff, I'm watching this broadcast. What do you mean the blind will see? I can see this broadcast. Well, maybe it will help you understand if I describe blindness from Ephesians chapter 2. When the Bible describes all human beings have been born dead in sin, we've been born spiritually blind. And until the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, we remain, Isaiah 29, in deep darkness. So my prayer is today that the Holy Spirit will start to open the eyes of God's people. Maybe some of us for the first time, maybe others of us for the 70th or the 700th time, but in a very powerful way, God will open the eyes of his people. I'm going to put something on the screens that we're going to learn about from the Bible today, and you already know this to be true. Our medical advancements in science, man, it's fascinating what they can do with surgery, laser surgery, like LASIK or PRK to fix eyesight. What we can do with a set of glasses to fix somebody's physical eyes is amazing. But you already know this. Spiritual blindness, the kind of chosen blindness where you refuse to see uh, what's happening around you, there's no set of glasses that can fix that. And because I'm an old man and have to wear glasses, I'm going to read from the Bible today one of my favorite passages of all times. Truly, I love this story from John chapter 9. Let me tell you why I love this story. It's not the miracle that Jesus does, though it's pretty spectacular what you hear in the Bible today. It's the dude who Jesus does this miracle with. He is so bold that this brother is literally going to call on the carpet the most powerful men in the land. He gets a little bit sassy today, and I love the fact that the blind man is able to see. And by the time that we get done with this passage, you'll be able to see that those people who should be able to see, they're actually blind because they choose not to see. And there's no glasses on the planet that can help somebody who refuses to see what you choose not to see. So the story begins in John chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible and you're in this room, we'd, be, we'd love to just give you one. It's out there on the table for you. Take it as our gift to you. If you're at home and you don't have a Bible, we put the scriptures right there in that mobile app so that you can follow along with us. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1, describes a guy who is born blind. Now, this is a problem in Jesus' day. And I think that there's some bad theology that happened in Jesus' day that continues to our day. And I need you to understand right out of the gate this sentence. Actually, I put two sentences on the screen in one, trying to save time and money. Not all sickness is the result of sin. But you know what? Theologically speaking, all sickness really is the result of sin. I got to explain that to you the way Jesus explains this to his disciples because they struggle with this theological concept. So let's see what happens when Jesus meets a man who's born blind and his disciples are trying to figure out whose sin is it, whose fault, who's sinned, that results in this man being born blind. Here we go. Let's roll up our sleeves. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. As he, Jesus, was passing by a man blind from birth. Now, you'll see several times today that the Bible won't let you miss the fact that this guy didn't develop a condition as a child and, was, uh, and became blind. He was born blind which theologically says something in Jesus' day. Jesus is walking by. There's a, a beggar who was born blind. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, that, uh, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Notice they didn't even consider there was any other option. This blindness must be the result of sin. So whose sin is it? Is it his sin 
or is it his parents' sin? Did you know in Jesus' day, the rabbis taught that you could literally sin while you're still in the womb. And so the disciples are asking, did this baby sin while he was still in mama's womb? Or was it mama and daddy's fault? Listen to Jesus' answer. It's profound. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Now, if you've been with us in the book of John, you know that John uses day and night. Here he goes again. He uses it not to talk about physical blindness or being able to see physically. He's talking about spiritual darkness, spiritual light. As long as I am in the world, Jesus speaking, as long as I am in the world, I am am the light of the world. After he said these things, look at this. He spit on the ground. He made some mud with, uh, from the saliva, and he spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. The Bible tells us that word means sent. And so the blind man left, washed, get this, and came back seeing His neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, isn't this the man who was, who used to sit begging? And some said, he's the one. And others were saying, no, he looks like him. He kept saying, I am the one. And so they asked him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus made some mud, spread it on my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So when I went and washed, I recovered my sight. And the crowd starts to ask, where is he? They asked. And the guy that was born blind said, I don't know. They're asking, where is he? Because they want to know who can do this kind of miracle in your life. I wonder what he can do in my life. Now, there's a few things about this story that I need to point out as we get started In Jesus' day, there was this bad theology, and I really think this is happening today, and John records this story for us to correct some bad theology. The religious leaders believed all sin was the result, or all suffering was the result of sin. And the more severe the suffering, the more severe the sin. Now, they taught That specific severe suffering is the result of specific severe sin. And if you'll notice, I made two statements that seem to be contradictory right out of the gate before we even looked at this. I said that not all sin, not all suffering is the result of sin. By that, I mean the word specific You and I cannot attach specific illness, specific difficulty, specific crisis in your life to specific sin. However, we can say that all sin is the result of suffering. Meaning, even the people on that tiny little Pacific island of Tonga that just got hit with a tidal wave because of a volcano that erupted in the middle of the Pacific, that alone is the result of sin, just not the specific sin of the people of Tonga. It goes all the way back to the first sin, to our first parents' sin in the Garden of Eden, when God said to Adam, our first father, the ground itself is cursed, and now life is going to be hard, not just for you, Adam, but for your descendants. And every problem on earth, to include blindness, is ultimately the result of some sin If nothing else, you can trace it all the way back to Adam's sin. But I need to caution us right now because maybe some of you have done what these friends and ultimately the religious leaders do today. You think that guy or that gal is going through what she's going through and it's her own fault. Because of this sin, she's going through that suffering. What we cannot do in this room is play God. Can I, hear, can I hear an amen? 
Only God knows what specific circumstances lead to specific results. We, we can say that all sin is the result of suffering, but not that specific suffering tied to that specific sin. And in this case, there's a guy who, while he was still in his mama's womb, his eyes weren't fully developed. And when mama gives birth, and we don't know mama's name, daddy's name, or this guy's name today, but when mama gives birth, she gives birth to a child that was born blind. You're going to see this very clearly from the Bible today. Everyone in Jesus' day believed if you were born blind, can't be fixed. Nobody can fix it. And I don't mean nobody on the planet can fix it. They believed God himself cannot fix somebody's eyes who were born blind. No one can fix this. So Jesus does something interesting. He spits on the ground, and he starts to work in the mud. Does this language sound familiar to you? Because when God was fashioning man and woman's eyes for the first time, God used dirt and fashioned the human body with his hands in the dirt. And by the way, if you want to know which one of the Godhead has hands, we're talking about Jesus. So the same one that fashioned the human body in the Garden of Eden is now working in the dirt dirt with his own spit and he fashions some mud and he presses the mud into the guy's eyes. Do you know that the word the Bible uses here is the word that you would have used in Old Testament or New Testament times to put the seal on a letter in the wax and send that letter off. Meaning Jesus just put his seal on this man's eyes and said, hey, Go wash in this pool in Jerusalem. Here's a picture of what this might have looked like. I don't know if these kids were actually there in Jesus' day. It's just an artist's description. But the reason he sent this guy to this pool is because it's very accessible, really easy to get to in the lower corner of Jerusalem. And Jesus says, go take this mud to this pool. Go wash the mud off. When the guy washes the mud off, he comes back seeing. And when his disciples asked, Jesus, why is this guy blind? Jesus said, it's not his fault. It's not even necessarily his mama's fault. Now, if Jesus would have taken it a step further, he might have said, it's actually Adam's fault. You can thank Adam for this. But he's blind because this good Jewish boy was set from birth to be a moment where God will put his glory on display. Did you hear me, church? Can you imagine How many times this boy in school got criticized because of the defect? Can you imagine how many times he heard in his society, you're not worthy because there's something wrong. You can't go into the temple because you're deformed. You're you're, um, not important to God and you're not important to us because there's something wrong with you. Picture in your mind how many times this man prayed God Heal me. And it didn't happen until the moment Jesus walked by. And when, the, when Jesus walked by, this was the moment God had orchestrated in all of human history that he was going to do something that was so miraculous. Wait till we read what happens next. That it is going to blow the minds of everyone in Jerusalem. Not him, not his parents, not his friends, even the religious leaders can't handle what just happened when God did this supernatural miracle that nobody can explain away. And as I was praying about this passage today, I was thinking, there are many Christians. I have friends that are pastors who live in a world where they can absolutely explain everything that happens to them every day, all day long. And I thought to myself, I don't want to live in that kind of world. I refuse to live in a world where absolutely everything can be explained because in that kind of world, there's no room for God. And God shows up in a very powerful way and the religious leaders can't handle it because they can't explain it. So listen to the conversation that happens when this man born blind gets called onto the carpet with some of the most powerful men in the world. And what you're going to see is the people that supposed to be able to see, they really can't because they're being blinded by two things. One, he was born blind and nobody can fix that. And two, the date when this happened, that for them 
is a real problem. John chapter 9, starting in verse 13. They brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. Now, if, you don't, if you're new to church, you're new to Christianity, and you don't recognize this word, these are the most powerful religious leaders in the land. But I want you to think them like the religious police. They're there to make sure that you follow the religious rules, and you follow the rules the way that they say to follow the rules. So something has just happened that didn't follow their rules, and they got a big problem. So let's take this guy who can now see and put him on the carpet in front of the religious elite of the day. They brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. The day that Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. Uh Uh-oh, we got a problem. Because you know what Jesus did on the Sabbath when he spit into the dirt and started to use the dirt to make some mud? Do you know what this was called in Jesus' day? work. Jesus was working on the Sabbath. We said nobody's supposed to be working on the Sabbath. We got a problem. And so the Pharisees asked him again. And by the way, this word in the Bible says again and again and again, and they keep getting the answer and they keep not wanting to hear that answer. So they ask him again, hoping that he's going to contradict himself and they can get an answer that they will accept. They ask him again and again and again how he received his sight. Listen to how bold this brother is. He put mud on my eyes, he told them. I washed and I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, speaking of Jesus, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, hold on now. How can a sinful man perform such signs? By the way, that word sinful is actually mortal. How can a mortal man do this? Because nobody can do this. And now there's a division among them. And so, again, they asked the man, the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? Like it's your fault that he opened your eyes on the Sabbath. How dare you become able to see on the Sabbath? And here's his answer. He's a prophet, he said. And the Jews did not believe this about Jesus. That the blind, they didn't believe even that the blind man received his sight until they summoned his parents. The ones who had, uh, the parents of the one who had received his sight. And they asked him, uh, is this your son? The one who you say, air quotes, was born blind? How then does he see? Now, you need to know that there is great fear at this point to the parents. And the Bible even tells us why. Uh, We know that this is our son, and we can attest, we know that he was born blind, his parents answered. But we don't know how he can now see. And uh, And we don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. Pause for just a second. In Jewish culture, when you turned 13, when a male turned 13 years old and one day, you're now a man. And when you are 13 and w- years and one day old, you now can stand trial for a crime. You now can be a witness in a testimony. And what his parents are saying is, we don't know how old this dude is, but he's older than 13 years and one day, and we're out. Like, it, this, is, this is on him, not on us. Because they're so afraid of these religious leaders. So afraid of what these religious leaders are going to say and do to the parents. Because they're even trying to discredit the parents and say, you know what, he really wasn't actually blind. He was just faking it his entire lifetime. And so they say, ask him. He's of age. And they, they said this because the parents, uh, the parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Look at what the Bible says. Since the religious leaders, the Jews had already agreed that if anyone, doesn't matter what the circumstances, if anyone con- confessed Jesus as the Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is why his parents said, ask him, he is of age. The parents are freaking out because the religious leaders are saying, you better give us the answer that we want to hear 
or we're going to kick you out of the church. Which in our day, people are like, so what? I don't care if you kick me out of the church. No, in their day, that was a big deal because it virtually guaranteed you can't do business anymore. You're a social outcast. You have no hope at a future because all of that was tied to the temple in Jerusalem. And we're going to kick you out of the fellowship. We're literally going to excommunicate you if you dare to claim what we've already convinced ourselves in our minds. No matter what anybody says, Jesus can't be the Messiah. So whatever you answer next, blind man, whatever you answer next, parents, it better not sound like Jesus is the Messiah. What they're trying to do is ultimately to discredit the guy. Okay, we can't explain away the mystery or this miracle. So we have to explain away the guy himself. Like maybe he's lying and he really wasn't blind. And so they bring him on trial, and this bold brother does not back down. I don't know what happened. I do know I was blind, and now I can see. And I know that the one who healed me, his name is Jesus. You guys tell me, you're the smart guys in the room, how this is possible. And they don't get the answer from the blind man that they want. So now they're going to try to discredit his parents. Basically, hey, come on, let's just admit it. This is all a big trick to try to get money so that your son can beg for money. He really wasn't blind, right? And the parents aren't biting. They're saying, look, we know this is our son, and we know that he was blind. We don't know how he can see. And by the way, we're out of it. It's, he's a grown man. Let him deal with this. We don't want anything to do with this because if uh, we say that he is really healed and it was healed on the Sabbath, you guys are going to kick us out of the church, which means we're going to be destitute and poor and basically die of starvation. So we don't want anything to do with this. And the parents run away like cowards as fast as they can, which now leaves the blind man and the religious leaders. Can you see what the Bible is trying to do for us today? It's showing us the guy who could not see, John chapter 9, verse 1, now can see. The guys who are supposed to be able to see, John chapter 9, verse 13, the Pharisees really can't see. They're really blind. And the reason why they're blind is because they live in a world where they have to be able to understand and explain everything, which leaves absolutely no room for God. It's actually worse than that. It's the kind of world where I'm God because I can understand, I can explain everything, and I can tell you right now, I don't want to live, I refuse to live in a world where I can explain everything that happens around me because that world leaves no room for God. In fact, that world makes me God. And the more that I've been praying, the harder that I have been seeking the face of the Lord on this, the more that I see him about to do something new, something beautiful, something that cannot be explained in his church. And I'm not talking Two Cities Church. I'm talking his church globally, and I have no idea what it looks like. But I will tell you this, man, I'm thrilled. I am so excited about the future. I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't even claim to be able to understand it or explain it, but I'm convinced it's going to be beautiful and different than anything that we've seen in our lifetime, and I'm looking forward to, I'm longing for that future. See, I think what the Bible is doing is it's moving us in this story to a point where we all have to admit what's on the screen. I mean, let's be honest, y'all. How many of you would have to say, I'm totally blind to my blindness until somebody points out that I'm blind? What the Bible is describing today is not a guy who was born blind. The Bible is describing, I really think the center character of this story is Jesus and the religious leaders who are blind and choose to be blind and refuse to see their blindness. There's a very famous woman, for those of you who are not from the United States, there's a very famous woman in the United States, lived in the late 1800s. Her name is Helen Keller, and she was born with sight and hearing. And then as an infant, she lost both her hearing and her sight. 
And there's this famous exchange where a teacher by the name of Ann Sullivan decides, I'm going to try to figure out how to communicate with somebody who is both blind and deaf. For the blind, we can use Braille. For the deaf, we can use sign language. But how do you communicate with somebody who's really never learned to communicate and now cannot see and cannot hear? Ann Sullivan, in education circles, is called the, get this, I didn't make this phrase up, it was given to her, the miracle worker, because she was able to learn to communicate with Helen Keller, a woman that was both born blind, or or became both deaf and blind at a very early age. Listen to Helen Keller's words about her world when she couldn't see what everybody else could see but could see what others couldn't see. Helen Keller said, I can see, and that's exactly why I'm happy. In what you would call a dark world, but to me is golden. And then listen to what she says next. Helen Keller says, I can see a God-made world, not a man-made world. And Helen Keller describes the beauty of being able to perceive God at work around her. She just doesn't need her eyes or her ears to be able to perceive it. There's now an argument. And this is where this brother doesn't just get bold. He gets a little bit sassy with the religious leaders of his day. John chapter 9, starting in 24. A second time, they summons this beggar, the man who had been blind, and told him, They throw their hands up and basically say, give glory to God. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. And he answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I can see. And so now they're really, really getting angry with this guy. They asked him, what did he do to you? And how did he open your eyes? Listen to this guy. He starts to get a little bit sassy here, right? Like, hey, I already told you. And I, and I already told you, and you didn't listen to me. Why do you want to hear it again? Look at this. Do you want to become his, or you don't want to become his disciples, do you? Like, boom, mic drop, walk off the stage. Because this guy is basically confronting now. Teaching the religious teachers is basically what he's doing. And they won't have that. So they ridicule him. Your this man, Jesus' disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God has spoken to Moses. Can I just tell you what they're saying to him? We implement the law. We're the, the religious law police around here, and the law came from Moses, and so we're Moses' disciples. We don't know who this guy is who opened your eyes. You're his disciple, but our Authority goes all the way back to Moses. And this teacher is, the teachers are about to get schooled right now because he's going to jump right over Moses and say, I think you're missing the one that Moses got the law from. I think that's who you're missing in this equation. We're, we know that, this, uh, that you're this man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciple. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't even know where he's from. Listen to this guy's reply. Well, this is an amazing thing, he said to them. You don't know where he's from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. The student is teaching the teachers now. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens, God listens to him. In other words, you claim authority from Moses. I'm going all the way back to the one Moses got his authority from. Throughout history, I did a little research today to see, is this guy's statement true? Throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. And they reply, Your mama. Literally, that's what they say to him. You were born entirely in your sin, they replied, and you're trying to teach us. And then they excommunicated him from the temple. They kicked him out of church for having the audacity to claim that he was born blind and now he can see. And a guy by the name of Jesus did that. How dare you make those kind of statements 
Listen, I hope you're not missing this from the Bible. The issue today is not what happened, that a man was born blind and now he can see. The issue today is not where it happened or how it happened. Jesus spit in the dirt, made some mud, put it on the guy's eyes, sent him to the pool to go wash. That's not the issue. The issue today is when it happened. The problem with these religious leaders is it's the Sabbath. And we know that you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And Jesus, this rebel rousing rabbi, I just did those three words on purpose, dares to do a miracle on the Sabbath. Oh, there's no way that Jesus is from God because he just broke our law. And we know he can't be from God if he broke our law. And this man born blind, he puts it all on the line to defend Jesus. Now, he doesn't have to defend Jesus, but he's basically calling out those who claim to be able to see, and he's telling them, I think you guys are actually the ones that are blind here. Because how could you not see what everybody else in town is talking about and everyone else can see? No one in history has ever heard of a man being born blind and then somebody does a miracle and now he can see. That's never happened. And you guys are trying to explain this away and argue that it's not for real because you, it doesn't fit within your neat little box. And I really want you to hear all of, all of us, every one of us have been born in some kind of blindness that is the result of sin. And until the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, we really can't see. It's a miracle of God. In fact, did you know that when the blockbuster movie, The Matrix, was made, the two brothers that tried to make this movie, actually what they were doing is making a modern-day parable about what it's like to be trapped in sin until God's Holy Spirit supernaturally works in your life to open your eyes and to make you alive for the first time. There's a very powerful scene in the very first movie, The Matrix, where Neo asks, why do my eyes hurt? And the answer is profound. If you understand that these two brothers, the, Warch the Wachowski brothers, were trying to give a modern parable of what the gospel does in somebody's life. Check out this movie clip, will you? We've done it, Trinity. We found him. I hope you're right. Far from it. He still needs a lot of work. What are you doing? Your muscles have atrophied. We're rebuilding them. Why am I, sir? You've never used them before. Rest, Neo. The answers are coming. We've done it, Trinity. Neo, this grown man who has been trapped in sin his entire life, gets pulled out of the matrix of sin, and he's able to see, and basically is born again and becomes alive for the first time. Now, if you go watch the rest of the Matrix movies, the brothers that make these movies, they go crazy. In fact, they personally go crazy, not just crazy with the movies. But the original movie was designed to say, I'm in my sin, and I can't see what I can't see because blindness can only be, uh, you can only see your blindness when you're no longer blind. And so the Holy Spirit steps in, and the Holy Spirit does a miracle to help God's people see, not just for the first time, but to help God's people see Jesus at work in your life this week. He helps us every day to see Jesus at work around us. And I have a challenge for you today, church. For somebody who's not a Christian, my challenge is that you would beg the Holy Spirit of the living God to open your eyes up, to pull back the scales, and to help you see for the first time, and that Jesus would wash your sin away, and that you would be born again and able to see.
for the very first time. I'm going to pray that over you in just a second. But the other challenge that I have is for all of God's people that we would say, Holy Spirit, I need you to help me see Jesus at work around me because this Jewish boy prayed for years, if not decades, God, heal me. And all along, God was planning and preparing to do a great miracle. He just couldn't see it until Jesus finally showed up and made some mud and gave this man his sight. And maybe it feels like God has left me and God doesn't care about me right now. Maybe you feel like this Jewish boy. I need you to know that it doesn't mean that God is not at work around you. So would you just bow? Would you let me pray? And we're going to wrap this service up in just a moment. Holy Spirit, you 